uh, I wouldn't make this disclaimer uh, as it is unnecessary to make. I, I, I wish to, 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 to point out, to start by uh, making it clear that I'm not here to support or oppose any cause uh, or any leader or any party. Uh, I'm here to proffer uh, and debate uh, ideas. Uh, and idea, ideas uh, in the uh, intellectual enterprise are what they are. Uh, they are, they are not uh, policies, they are not decrees, uh, they are ideas uh, which, uh, if the interaction is meaningful, uh, help us uh, to understand the issues of common interest uh, while acknowledging the obvious fact that need not be said, namely that we are different. Uh, we have different political affiliations, uh, religious affiliations, cultural backgrounds, uh, different ethnic backgrounds. Uh, but uh, we are Zimbabweans, uh, and, and uh, there will never be a time uh, when um, we eliminate those differences, uh, but we endeavor to discover uh, cross-cutting issues of common interest and I think this opportunity uh, you, have, you have presented is a, a good example of uh, a cross-cutting opportunity to discuss issues that are uh, of common interest notwithstanding our differences. Now, uh, with the MDCTA or MDCT and MDCA it, uh, it's the only party with two names Triple uh, C and ZANU PF ahead of the 23 general elections on the back of the uh, by elections that were held uh, in March on the 26th of March. If the old and still persuasive cliche that politics is the art of the possible still holds sway, as many students of politics uh, would like to think so, a necessary question to ask in the aftermath of the recent by-elections is this. What is possible for Douglas Monzora? and his MDCT or MDCA, depending on the day. What is possible for Nelson Chamisa and Triple C? What is possible for Emerson Mnangagwa and ZANU PF, as the Zimbabwean body politic gears itself towards the 23, 2023 rather, general election? This question is important because even though a number of uh, the other, the, the smaller parties, I think there were 16 or so that were in the basket of uh, the 26th uh, March 2022 by elections. And there may even be others that might spring up down the stretch as we approach 2023. Uh, even though these might uh, have an impact on the 2023 general election, the post by elections dynamics among Monzora, Chamisa, Mnangagwa, as well as the interaction between the MDCT or MDCA, Triple C, and ZANU PF in and outside parliament will greatly shape the political landscape of the 2023 elections. And they will shape the landscape as political parties as well as as political leaders the ones i have named uh, of these three parties why is this so it's because all told 
the by-elections which took, pl- uh, t- took place in uh, some 1,990 polling stations covering 265 wards in 28 constituencies and 122 local authorities were not only an electoral contest between the three parties and these uh, others, the smaller ones. But more importantly, the by-elections were also a referendum on Douglas Monzora, on Nelson Chamisa, and Emerson Mnangagwa in their respective parties. This is notwithstanding, of course, that as we saw in the campaign, it appeared that the size of crowds at their rallies uh, were more important than the voters in the by-elections. Now, while the results uh, of the by-elections have attracted uh, mixed uh, reviews and even competing interpretations, and uh, most of the reviews and interpretations are now common cause in that we are, at least if you follow politics in Zimbabwe, you would be familiar with them. Their substantive meaning and political implications for uh, the forthcoming general election as a referendum on Mnangagwa and his Danupiev, Chamisa and his Triple C and Monzora and his MDCT or MDCA remain open for critical debate. I believe uh, it is in Zimbabwe's public and national interest that we have that kind of debate. And uh, uh, this discussion uh, this evening, at least in our part of the world, is a contribution to that debate. In case something loses its place along, uh, as I make the presentation. Uh, let me make clear up front uh, the conclusion. Uh, so when you are talking to people you, you don't see and they're just hearing your voice uh, and because that has its own dynamics. It is uh, uh, useful to start with your conclusion so that if they want to go, they will go with the conclusion uh, and make the argument to support the conclusion later. So, I take the view that to understand the aftermath of the by-elections, uh, especially as it relates to the forthcoming general election, invites seven propositions. First is that you need a theory of the case meaning you need an understanding or appreciation of the self-interpretation of society as a theory of the case, a self-interpretation which is informed in this case by the elections campaign, the by-elections campaign, because the campaign was in the final analysis more about the party leaders and their political parties. So we need to have a theory of the case or an understanding of how Zimbabwe interprets itself in terms of what the critical issues or questions of the day are and how those related to the uh, by-elections campaign. Second, the by-elections missed their context. 
there was a very important context to the by-elections which did not come out during the elections but which is certainly going to come out now going uh, uh, forward to the uh, forthcoming general election. And this has to do with the reasons why, how, and when the by-elections occurred in the first place. And during the campaign, this did not come out. Third, the by-elections confirmed the, 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 the death of the MTC uh, as a political movement. While this came out uh, in various uh, media platforms, it did not come out in, 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 in the campaign as a political issue. Uh, and it is uh, certainly, in my view, going to be a talking point uh, towards the 2023 elections. Fourth, the by-elections forced the birth of Triple C. Uh, it's arguable whether there was going to be Triple C uh, without the, uh, the by-elections, but it probably was going to be a very difficult ask or, or proposition. But thanks to the by-elections, uh, something called Triple C or it was like some kind of uh, not a natural birth and, and, and not even a kind of a caesarean uh, uh, birth or operation. But somehow this was forced. Uh, and, 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 and this is one of the major issues that is going to play out going forward uh, to, 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 the, to, to the 2023 elections. Already how Triple C is presenting itself in public, uh, sometimes uh, taking the hide and seek approach, uh, has a great deal to do with the fact that uh, its birth was uh, forced by the by, by the by election. Uh, it was born uh, two days uh, before the sitting. Uh, uh, of, of, of the uh, nomination court. And because its path was forced, its growth is not assured, not least because uh, it's still early days uh, and, and, and the early days so far, what we see, what we hear, what people are talking about, what we're analyzing, smacks of uh, a, a birth of something we have seen before. It, it smacks of a birth of something uh, uh, familiar. Uh, elsewhere, I've described it, uh, it as a recycled uh, MDC. Fifth. The by-elections exposed ZANU-PF's conundrum as a party of members who are trapped uh, and, and, uh, inside of an uncomfortable home uh, in which they feign loyalty because they cannot exit. They are afraid of what is outside uh, or what is outside uh, is, is, uh, threatens them. Uh, and because they are trapped and they, they feign loyalty, they can't voice any criticism internally. And this was very clear during the, 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 the by-elections, and we're going to see more and more of uh, those dynamics uh, uh, as the general election approaches, the next general election. Sixth, the by-elections put a spotlight on entitlement as the bane of Zimbabwean politics. If there is one thing that defines politics in Zimbabwe, and I mean organized politics across the political divide, it is this animal called entitlement. Uh, when you want to unpack politics in a community or country, nation, sometimes it helps to look for the one thing which tells the full story from the beginning to where you are. 
and the Zimbabwean political story told in its complete uh, uh, and um, uh, with its all manifestations from 1980 to 2022, uh, May 5, is entitlement. Uh, and 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 this is uh, where uh, all hell uh, uh, breaks loose across the political divide. Uh, and 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 how Zimbabweans uh, deal ultimately with uh, entitlement will determine the extent to which uh, they may. Uh, at long last, uh, make the breakthrough to the arrested uh, transition, or at least the, atten the transition which has remained arrested uh, hitherto. And lastly, the seventh, is that of course, there has to be a way out of this quagmire, uh, and, and um, uh, the one uh, way that suggests itself, uh, in my view, uh, given our history and where we are, is the need for the development and promotion of uh, uh, a national a spirit a corp, which is uh, uh, based on shared constitutional values uh, that we can all uh, relate to and associate with uh, to break the barriers and build the bridges uh, that can bring Zimbabweans together uh, beyond electoral politics. Now, given this, the, the, the challenge for any political analyst is that uh, when you look at something like by-elections, the 26th of March by-elections, or the forthcoming general election, or anything for that matter, and you look at it uh, with a view to analyzing it, you encounter the reality that before your analysis, society analyzes itself. Before you develop your own story, before you develop your own narrative or theory of society, you must deal with the fact that society has its own narrative, society ha has its own story, and you must unpack and understand that story. And that story invariably comes out of common practice or shared values, and it, it, it uh, uh, usually constitutes the dominant practice in that society. In other words, a political analyst must find out what is actually going on rather than coming up with things in, in their head and imagining that what is in their head is, what is, is what's going on. Uh, and, and, and they do this in terms of defining the features and characteristics of the society regarding its self-interpretation and who is behind that self-interpretation that is seen through praxis, through actions. The, the things that are happening, and uh, uh, what are the reasons and purposes or ends uh, behind uh, or being pursued by those who are behind uh, uh, the, the actions or the self-interpretation. -in so this quest is essentially a methodological quest, and I raise it uh, parenthetically in passing because it's important or at least it answers a critical question, uh, whether what we are talking about, the things we are going to say, the things I'm going to share with you, are they complete? Are they balanced? Are they fair? Uh, do they constitute an empirical description of the situation or problem or what I mean? terms of what's going on. And this is really important today in the age of uh, 
the new digital uh, platforms for sharing ideas where a lot of stuff is anecdotal. Uh, anyone comes up with a one-liner uh, and, and, and would like to have others take that one line as, as a theory uh, or even worse, uh, as, a, as a gospel truth. So it's important in the back of our mind to have this question, are we empirical about what we're talking about? Or are we talking about what people want to hear? I mean, the extent to which polit political correctness has gone these days is very alarming. People are right by uh, virtue of who they are or what political party they belong to or who they say they support. They are not right by the power or rationality or evidence of the argument that they may be making. So one way of capturing this, uh, uh, which is the uh, society self-interpretation, is asking a simple but very useful uh, question about what people in their various walks of life are complaining uh, or f uh, quarreling about. Uh, uh, especially in their representative organizations, such as political parties. What are they complaining about? What are the people saying uh, uh, bothers them? Because out of that discussion, you know, politics is about quarrels over one thing or another. So what are people quarreling about? Uh, broadly speaking, from an, an, an empirical point of view, I want to suggest this as a backdrop uh, and, 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 and move on to uh, uh, specific areas that uh, deal with uh, our question this evening. As far as I see it, Zimbabwe's self-interpretation is defined by complaints or quarrels over lives and livelihood issues. The everyday life of an overwhelming majority of Zimbabweans is bedeviled by hunger, joblessness, homelessness, disease, and ignorance. We all are, at least I'm sure most of us are familiar with a, a recent uh, World Bank uh, study, uh, which uh, many uh, debated uh, when it came out uh, sometime last year that some 7, uh, 9 million Zimbabweans live on less than $1.90 a day, and that these Zimbabweans are classified as extremely poor. It is also, if you look at various uh, sources, you will uh, find out that uh, approximately some 75% uh, of the Zimbabwean population, a whooping three quarters of our population, lives on less than $5.50 uh, a day. And half of our population live below the food poverty line. Of course, uh, we, we, we are in a census here, we'll find out uh, soon if, if all is going well, how many Zimbabweans uh, uh, they are. But most of these Zimbabweans, three quarters who live on $5.50 a day, also, uh, apart from the challenge of the food challenge, have no roof over their head. And about 4 million Zimbabwean uh, children are in conditions of chronic hunger. They are chronically hungry. Now, save for intermittent uh, outbursts on Twitter or other social media platforms uh, by everyone else, and perfunctory statements on special occasions by political leaders 
uh, and others in, in uh, civic society organizations and so forth, churches. Uh, save for those instances, the livelihood plight of three quarters of Zimbabweans, which is very easy to, to summarize because it, uh, and, and even to quantify, because it is a livelihood matter, is not part of the daily debates in Zimbabwe, in the electronic, print, or digital media platforms such as this one, or even the common ones like WhatsApp and so forth. The trending topics usually have nothing to do with this alarming situation of three quarters of the population uh, livelihood threatened on a daily basis, uh, people living from hand uh, to, to mouth without as, uh, any, 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 any assistance. Elsewhere, in the civilized world, the everyday politics, quarrels, debates on Twitter and so forth would be about this situation because that is that, the, that is the country. It's 75% of the population. Uh, that is also, uh, that is the country if you are the ruling party or the government. That's who you should be concerned about. You should not be tweeting about all oh, this other nonsense that we usually see. You should be tweeting about that uh, and what, what is being done and, and keeping uh, a track on, on, on um, the impact of what is being done uh, and, 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 and the uh, 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 successes. I mean, you want to, well, uh, it's amazing, you know, people uh, drill a borehole and they call the whole world uh, to see, celebrate. They put a footbridge. They want everyone to come and see. Uh, but they never say that this uh, borehole of this footbridge is contributing to the alleviation or amelioration of the livelihood quandary of this 75% of the population in this or to this extent, and we are making progress. If you, have, if you are leading a country with 75% of the population in this kind of existential quandary, surely you would expect that to be the primary focus of your politics. Similarly, if you, you are in the opposition, that should be the, 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 the base of your politics. That's where the votes are uh, in this 75%. That, that's where uh, the manifesto should be focused on. I raise this because if you look back at the by-elections campaign, uh, and, 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 and one which many said that uh, is smacked of a mini general election or was a mini general election. It was not in any way, shape or form focused on the lives and livelihoods of these 75% of the people. There was nothing uh, about that. Uh, it was about the leaders. And, uh, and in some cases, the leaders uh, uh, did not mind saying, you know what? Uh, we know there are local authority elections here. We know there are uh, uh, constituencies here, but that's not important for now. What is important for now is for us to put our, uh, our eyes on the prize, and the prize is 2023. Uh, yet, you can imagine uh, how meaningful it would be if you kind of uh, ground uh, if if you are already thinking about 2023, uh, it is about numbers, it's about votes. 75% of the people are finding it difficult to make uh, ends meet. But um, yeah, they said these by-elections by are a dress rehearsal for the 2023 general election. But we didn't see the dress uh, let alone the rehearsal uh, in terms of the existential challenges that compatriots uh, who make up 75% of the population and who are there for the main base of the electorate uh, uh, suffer or encounter on a daily basis. So what was the campaign about? 
and what was it for? How does it uh, relate to the forthcoming general election if it was not uh, uh, about uh, lives and livelihood for the majority of the people? What emerges from the foregoing is that it is not possible to do meaningful politics without a theory of the case. Uh, it is dangerous in politics to be self-indulgent, to have a theory of the situation based on self-projection. It should be based on the self-interpretation of, of society. It must be informed by society's self-interpretation. Uh, and it, once you have uh, that, it becomes reasonably possible, I would say, with easier facility to come up with an alternative to the status quo. And the alternative to the status quo, prevailing theory of the case, is necessarily a critique of that theory of the case. And it, and, and it becomes an interesting grounded story and the messaging becomes possible, uh, which is uh, grounded. Uh, uh, you don't get, I, I don't know about others, but uh, for me, I'm, I, I, you know, there's a kind of politics which is okay during election campaigns, such as we witnessed to, uh, in the, in the by-elections, where uh, the contending parties critique one another, like, you know, this one said this yesterday, but this is not true because what is true is A, B, C, D, and so forth. But, you know, uh, um, in the end, you know, politics is, uh, is, is not about what you are against or who you are against. It is about what you are for and who you are for, because what you are for should resonate with who you are for in order to have a meeting of minds, in order to touch the hearts and minds of people. If you always churn out anecdotes about this, about that, from left, from right, from center, uh, you end, you will, you, 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 when you do that, you are the audience of what you are doing. And of course, uh, if you are on Twitter, you may have uh, a, a lot of, uh, uh, what do they call them, retweets or, or likes, uh, some quite genuine, but many will be coming from people who want to waste your time. Uh, uh, every country now has uh, intelligence organizations that specialize in these bots that know that um, we are um, a vain creatures. God didn't fortify us. So uh, when we say something and someone applauds, we like. And the way of applauding something so that you keep in your own world on Twitter is for people to show you likes and so forth. Um, and, and, and then you become, you, you, you are the self-audience. But meanwhile, there are these excluded people out there whose votes you desperately need. Um, and and I, 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 I think that the by-elections in so far as uh, they were uh, presented as a mini general election and 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 address has a rehearsal for 2023 a uh, kind of in this just one case missed the boat and because they did that they also ended up missing a critical context the context what was the context of those by elections you know in the civilized world, and, and, and in terms of our constitution, even our constitution presupposes a, a civilized world, that a by-election must uh, happen in um, a, um, uh, 90 days uh, after it has been proclaimed, and it has, it has to be proclaimed immediately. Uh, so usually, 
you would, you would not have 28 by elections. This is a, a eccentric. This is a Zimbabwean invention. It's not happening for the first time. It's a dangerous one. It, 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 it happened even in 2015, although not after a long delay like this, because then there were many, uh, when we had uh, by-elections uh, in uh, June of uh, 2015, it was because of a major earthquake in, 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 in the MDCT, uh, which uh, uh, threw up a number of constituencies. But it is bizarre to have 28 by-elections because a by-election is normally caused by a death, a resignation, and it, you know, so it's like we are having seven by-elections in Kariba. Uh, so you have, to, uh, you have to have reasonable numbers and so forth. The fact that these were high is in the context. It has to do with how they occurred and how they occurred presented quite uh, an opportunity. Uh, a, a, as we all know, we don't need to belabor this point that it was the unprecedented abuse of a Supreme Court judgment to construct a new bridge in the irrational hope of recovering water under an old bridge uh, in order to give life to a, a mute case. Um, that abuse, which was scandalous and outrageous, taken to, uh, together with the abuse of the judgment that empowered Togozani Kupe, who had participated in the 2018 election as a leader of her own party called MDCT, participated as a presidential candidate, fielded uh, parliamentary and um, local government candidates and so forth, and lost suddenly is empowered by a court to run the party of those who defeated him. I mean, this makes us foolish. Uh, and and, 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 and I, I was tempted to, to use a, 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 a stronger word. Not, not to the rest of the world who may not understand us and what is going on, but to ourselves. Uh, and and, 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 and uh, uh, that... Uh, unprecedented uh, development uh, with the recalls of MPs and the uh, and, and, and councillors and so forth um, gave a context to this uh, by-election. But what was particularly insidious about that is the impact on the electorate in in two ways. That impact one, it overturned the, the will of the electorate as expressed in 2018. Anywhere else in the civilized world, you overturn the will of the people, forget the impact on the councillors and MPs who have been recalled. The public should be as mad as hell and they say, we will not take this anymore. That's what you would expect. But obviously, it also happens if the political community, organized society, triggers uh, or, 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 uh, or enables uh, the public to do this. That was in uh, the one respect. The other, which made a bad situation worse, was to effect vacancies, cause vacancies through these recalls, and then lie that you can't hold the by-election. You, you will violate the constitution you will, need, you will not seek the authority of the Constitutional Court in your violation. You will just issue a statutory instrument, uh, which is nothing in front of the Constitution. But you will come up with a long-winded, uh, badly written statutory, statutory instrument to say, thou shalt not hold by, by elections. But the effect of saying that is to cause constituencies and words to go without representation for two years. Others have their MPs and their councillors, they go, they debate in parliament, the, the parliamentarians, MPs are doing uh, some mobilization for resources to take care of the sick in the constituency, the young uh, uh, who need the support for school fees, for this. They have no MP for two, for two years. 
they had an MP, but this MP has now been uh, recalled by a political party that uh, the MP defeated in 2018. But now you are humming the society. I think that it is shocking that uh, many people, certainly I count myself among those, expected the by-elections to focus on that context of how this occurred. The disenfranchisement of the voter. How, how you know, what kind of a society would allow, allow one 28 or 122 communities, 122 wards or 28 constituencies to go without a, a representation for an indefinite period. And no one really cries to say I'm mad as hell and, and, and we need to put a stop. Surely if the by-elections were a mini general election that will impact on the forthcoming general, actual general election, that should have driven people crazy. But the people needed the contesting parties to address that. And it was quite shocking and surprising that this was not so. How else will you, uh, is the, uh, are you going to raise the consciousness of the electorate uh, for, for them to be issue co uh, conscious? So we had by-elections without a political contest. It's very important because this similar issue at a substantive level is now before the country. What is the context, the national context of the forthcoming general election? They missed the national context of the 2018 general ele election, that this was a coup, seven months old, and there was no way a seven month old, old coup would tolerate an election. Therefore, either don't go into it, or if you are going to go into it, uh, take the following posture as, as, a, as a, a, an outcome of uh, a response to a, a theory of the case. So a political context was made, is missed, and the, the, the by-election happened, uh, 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 the by-elections happened. Um, uh, uh, from the outline that I gave, uh, I have eight points. I'm on fourth point now, and I'm going to try and speed up because I see my time is, 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 is really gone. This cut is doing man way. Now, uh, quickly, what, uh, uh, where are we uh, uh, after the by-elections and, and before these major by-elections, mini, uh, mini general election, before the major election? Well, uh, one significant uh, feature of the by-elections which shall be recorded uh, into time immemorial is that in the by-elections, through the by-elections, Senator Monzora managed uh, to pull a historic feat of uh, killing a whole movement called the MDC. Uh, that will not be forgotten. The results of the by-election will be forgotten very soon uh, in 14 months. But what will not be forgotten in 14 months, thanks to Monzora, is that he killed the MDC. Uh, some will argue that he was used to kill the MDC. Well, people write songs, but we remember singers of those songs. Somebody wrote the song, Monzora sang it so loud that he will be credited with massacring the MDC, a whole movement, uh, and and managed a, a, a feat that uh, ZANU-PF had failed to achieve. Uh, even when I was uh, uh, with the ZANU-PF, we worked very hard and tried to deal with the MDC, but failed only to have one Monzora to succeed with just one soup. Uh, that history will not forget. Uh, 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 and, 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 and that is going to be a factor in the forthcoming election, because a party that had been quite effective and dominant in Zimbabwe's election since 2000 will not be there in 2023. Uh, it, it, it will be there nominally, um, but it's gone. 
Uh, but we should point out uh, to Monzora's cr uh, credit or to, to the credit of those who, who, of his handlers that the strategy worked in terms of the life of this parliament in the sense that although ZANU-PF has a majority in the National Assembly, um, uh, uh, and 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 they, they, although the 54 or so seats that um, Monzora has uh, as MDCT or MDCA, uh, even after the by-elections, uh, um, nominally controls. Uh, the MDCT, MDCA remains an important player in parliament in the Senate, where Monzora himself uh, uh, likely sits together with 25 or so others. Only the MDCT, MDCA can be in the Senate. The triple C cannot be in this Senate until the dissolution of, uh, of parliament. It's not possible, even if vacancies come up, Monzora can put whoever he wants, he can even put his cousins and uncles and nephews um, uh, 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 in, in, there in the, in the, in the Senate, uh, a situation that is different in, in, in uh, the National Assembly. After the by-elections, there is this very strange situation where we know that there are uh, most of the, if, uh, well, not all, certainly, but most of the 54, uh, um, if we remove the uh, the 18 who, who had been elected in 2018 and have come back as triple C, uh, they now know that there is no rational MP who had crossed the floor with the Monzora, who is sitting there thinking they can be re-elected in any configuration of Monzora, post-Congress that he's talking about, or, uh, and so forth. It's impossible. The name of the game is now run. So they are there nominally. But it's strange that there are others who are triple C who are wearing Monzora's colors in parliament. Uh, why they have not resigned uh, boggles the mind. It's just one of these strange things in Zimbabwean politics where you see politicians doing things which are useful to themselves as individual, as individual uh, politicians or leaders, but not useful to the constituencies that they represent. You have to show some evidence of standing by and for your constituents. It's a small place. It's one of the 210 if you are a councillor or one of the 1,958 if you are, I mean, if you are a ward councillor, it's one of the 1,958. And if you are an MP, one of the 210. Why are you not prepared to stand with that small thing? No one is asking you to stand with uh, for Zimbabwe, the big thing. That constituency, it is very important for a politician to stand with and by their constituencies because the best politics are local. That triple C MPs, think that it is somehow strategic to be MDCA in parliament when you are known that you are a triple C. Uh, it's strange. It's stranger that Monzora now has lost uh, the, the courage to wield his, ass, uh, the, his uh, um, acts uh, and, 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 and put those guys out. He can't now. Uh, because uh, everybody knows. It renders the whole parliament not a serious uh, 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 institution. Now, let me move quickly to the implications from move from uh, Monzora and his two MDCs to the triple C. Uh, most pundits have by and large credited triple C with having won the, the by-elections that we are talking about. Uh, merely by dint of having won 19 out of the 28 uh, that uh, were contested. While this is understandable, makes sense, uh, political sense, that is, 
it is nevertheless problematic in that by-elections are first and foremost defined by which party held the seat before the by-election and is therefore defending that seat. It's common cause that Monzora threw away the seats because the incumbent made it clear that they were not loyal to him or his state-sponsored electoral theft. In response, Monzora literally just said, to hell with you, I can do without these 20 seats. He did not believe, nor did his handlers believe, that he had a chance in heaven of winning any one of those seats. But of course, they didn't know that it was going to be a festival of zeros, but they certainly didn't give him a chance of winning. Now, the fact that the winners of the seats in the 2018 election, who were recalled, defended their seats, means that these were not free seats, so to speak. These seats, uh, the, 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 the 20 seats, uh, which were on offer on the uh, 26th of March, had owners, owners, those who owned them, the 2018 owners. And the fact that those owners def <clears throat> defended the, the, the seats, excuse me, colored the by-elections. Because we, they were defended by, they were defended today or the, on, on the day of the by-election by the people who yesterday were the MPs and so forth. They were therefore not free seats. In the circumstances, the owners successfully defended 18 out of the 20 seats that were on offer, meaning they lost two. Their party managed to grab one seat away from their port, that is the Kweke Central seat, which they had not won in, in 2018. The fact that they lost two of their 2018 seats clearly is a major challenge that should concern them going to, forward with implications for the 2023 general election. And in my view, what makes this issue particularly challenging is that an MDC, a, 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 or rather, because they ran uh, one dose as MDCA in 2018 means that they are now triple C candidates and therefore they did not perform well in the parliamentary elections. They were not only outperformed by ZANU PF candidates, except in Chegwood West, and I'm talking about 2018, where Zek cheated in broad daylight in favor of ZANU PF's text and donor, but they were also outperformed by their presidential candidate, Nelson Chamisa, who won 85 out of 210 constituencies, where they won only 63. He outperformed them by 22 constituencies. This is very, very important. The performance of the MPs in 2018 was not, and I'm talking about those people who now call themselves Triple C. Their performance in 2018 was not as good as Chamisa's performance. He, he did better than them. And, and, and even where they were winning, uh, in a number of cases where they were winning uh, in the 63, he was also winning and getting better margins uh, than them. That is the cause for concern going into 2023. In simple terms, Triple C has a strong presidential candidate going forward and a, and a weak slate of parliamentary candidates. And while supporters of uh, uh, Chamisa might say, yes, we always tell you, you know, the president is better than you. It is dangerous for a presidential candidate to have a weak slate of parliamentary and local authority candidates. In fact, this is one of the challenges that Chamisa has going forward to win the presidency. He will need strong 210 parliamentary candidates and 1,958 ward council candidates. Without this, it becomes a tall order. But the real challenge for Triple C ahead of the 2023 election is to be 
or not to be a brand new party? That is the question. So far, all structural indications are that Triple C is a recycled MDCA launched in 2019. A new brand in politics is not declared. It is formed and seen. Politics is praxis. People can say, oh, strategy, blah, 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 blah. The strategy is what you see and not what you keep in your pocket. If that is the plan, well, to say we can declare and then, uh, and then, and then things will happen, uh, the jury is still out and the clock is ticking and time is running out. Triple C has clear present, present uh, clear and present issues it needs to address regarding its organizational capacity. You cannot, it was okay to run for the by-elections with that uh, aura of invisibility, popularity, only kid, new kid on the block. 14 months time, there's no new kid on the block. You cannot win by whatever means without an organizational capacity. And you cannot win by whatever means without a structural capacity at the grassroots level. No one needs to preach to the triple C people. They have been around at least since 1999. And they know that one feature that uh, made a big difference for the MDC as it was then were those affiliated organizations from the trade unions uh, to the community-based organizations, the CSOs, NGOs, the ORAPs of this world, uh, the student movements, and so forth. And uh, at the moment, the surrounding environment of, of Triple C doesn't show that going to 2023. And it's difficult to show that if you don't have uh, the organizational capacity and structural capacity that I referred to. Lastly, uh, on this, it will be remiss of me not to comment on the Congress issue. It's entirely up to the founders, I agree, the founders of a political party uh, can, and it's up to them to decide who they propose to put as their best fit forward and how they propose to do that. So a Congress in name or in substance is not a political necessity for any political party to have ahead of any election. That position is no brain. It's, we all know that. But, be that as it may be, if or when a political party presents itself as a democratic alternative to trigger what it calls a democratic breakthrough in the country, then, ipso facto, that raises legitimate public expectations that it will not reinvent the wheel, but that it will do what a zillion of other democratic parties before it have done or under similar circumstances. So, no serious democratic party intent on winning political power has ever established itself without a constitution or without a launch meeting of one sort or one kind or another, equivalent to a Congress. It's a, useless to bother about the nomenclature. Call it whatever you want. It's mind boggling that a political party can claim to exist without a constitution. If you don't have a constitution, you don't exist as a political party. You are anything else, but certainly not a political party. It's just unheard of. As for Congress, in 2018, the MDCA, as it then was, got into the general election as a political party without going to Congress and without a constitution. Yet, it could have gone into that election as a new political party with a constitution. It only came up with a constitution and went to Congress in 2019. What then later transpired is history. Some of the nonsense that the country has been subjected to following that Supreme Court uh, judgment 
could have actually been foreseen and or avoided by the MDC. So if C enters the 2023 general election without a Congress and without a constitution, what might happen after the 2023 elections, depending on their outcome, is anybody's guess. But what we can say is that in Africa, you can cross the same river at the same place with the same result, twice. Finally, in the by-elections, and this is about we the ZANU-PF, in the by-elections, ZANU-PF's goal was to win at least 50% of the 28 constituencies. They are quiet about it, but that was their objective. They wanted to win at least 14 by retaining its seven that had become vacant, five by death, one by recall, and another by resignation, and winning at least seven. And among the seven are the two that they won, um, uh, which had been won by the MTC in 2018. They did not get their objectives. They can say, wow, wow, well, yes, we did that. But the fact of the matter is, no, you, you, uh, we can't have simplistic judgments about what have you achieved, what have you not. We, will, we have to measure people by their own objectives. They wanted to get 50%. They fell short. Uh, they returned the seven, uh, 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 as already indicated, uh, and won those two. It can thus be said that they suffered a setback by not meeting their targets. Uh, however, although ZANU-PF did not meet its targets, it is significant that it retained its seats to keep its two-thirds majority in the National Assembly, which was at 145 con constituencies and won two seats from the opposition to strengthen that majority at 147 constituencies. The by-elections, however, for ZANU-PF, were significant in that they reaffirmed a Boram Sango pattern witnessed in the 2018 general election that showed ZANU-PF parliamentarians outperforming Amazon Mnangagwa. For example, in 2018, ZANU-PF parliamentarians won in 145 constituencies where Mnangagwa won in only 125. They outperformed him by 20 constituencies not to mention the huge margins they registered against him in the 125 constituencies that he controversially won. This means that going forward, ZANU-PF has since perfected its Boram Sango strategy, which it uh, first used with the disastrous consequences in 2008, when it lost both the presidential and parliamentary elections. Uh, their intention then was to lose only the presidential election. But as you recall, the two MDCs got 110 constituencies out of 210, and ZANU-PF emerged with only 99. So, as after the by-elections, looking ahead, ZANU-PF has a weak presidential candidate and a, and a strong slate of parliamentary candidates whose victories do not translate favorably for the presidential candidate. This, I think, is a new, certainly a different ZANU-PF. And how so? What is happening in ZANU-PF? And what did we see in the by-elections which we might see in the 2023 general election? Why are these ZANU-PF voters who have perfected the Boram Sango strategy not prepared to speak out within ZANU-PF in between elections. How come they speak only at elections? They are quiet in between elections. Uh, I think there is an explanation. Since uh, Mnangagwa outstayed uh, Mugabe in uh, November 2017, uh, an existential threat to ZANU-PF, uh, which presents a major reform opportunity in Zimbabwe, is the political situation of the silent majority of ZANU-PF members and supporters. In fact, in my view, over the years since 1980, 
the political situation and importance, importance, importance of ZANU-PF's silent majority as a critical constituent group with a potential to fuel progressive re reforms is the one strategic factor that has been unexamined in Zimbabwean politics. It continues to go begging. Outside of a military power grab, as happened in November 2017, and given Zimbabwe's political history and its roots in the anti-colonial liberation and nationalist struggle, that is inextricably associated with ZANU-PF. It is impossible for any major reform headway to be made in Zimbabwe without the support of a significant part of ZANU-PF silent majority. This brutal truth has escaped the attention and understanding of the political opposition in Zimbabwe. And by political opposition, I don't mean anyone's favorite party or anyone's uh, hate party. I mean the opposition writ large. Just like the political support of the silent majority in Kenneth Kaunda's UNIP was crucial for the success of Zambia's democratic transition in 1991, as was the support of the silent majority in Kamuzubanda's MCP in Malawi's democratic transition in 1994, and the silent majority in Daniel Arab Moes Kanu in Kenya's democratic transition in 2002, the support of Robert Mugabe's silent majority in ZANU-PF remains indispensable to Zimbabwe's democratic transition in the foreseeable future. It will not remain an open-ended issue, but we are within its lifespan, and it is indispensable to any possible democratic transition in the country. ZANU-PF silent majority is the only major political group that did not support the November 2017 military coup. Whereas other political persuasions came out in their numbers and in full force on 18 November to rally on the, or rather rally for the military coup under the Mugabe must go mantra, ZANU-PF silent majority did not rally for Mugabe's ouster. They did not understand then where the coup was coming from and they still do not understand today why Mnangagwa is at the helm of ZANU-PF. The more they learn about it, the more they understand and learn about the November 2017 military coup, the more they are alienated from Nangagwa, whom they have not forgiven for that coup in general, but in particular for his ouster of Mugabe. That is ZANU-PF politics, We're not talking about other people's party politics, ZANU-PF. This ZANU-PF silent majority is politically bewildered, scattered, and restless. How it votes in 2023 is likely to tip the presidential scales. And finally, why is, is, is it, you know, and this is really final, why, you know, uh, by way of conclusion, with the general uh, election due within the next 14 months or so, why? Is it that the foregoing begs and, you know, the foregoing this stuff that we've been talking about? Why is it that it begs an important question? And, and the question being this, uh, it's similar to a wonderful small political novel that Tim uh, wrote about Nigeria. What is wrong with Zimbabwe? What is the trouble with Zimbabwe? Why is it that electoral politics do not seem to engender progressive reforms? I close by uh, hazarding a proposition. It's because of the culture of entitlement politics, which culture has become deeply entrenched in our body politic across the political divide. Entitlement politics breeds violence, tribalism, one centers of power, corruption, and all kinds of ills that have come to define Zimbabwe's national politics. You've chased those uh, one by one, you will be lost. You want to go after them all. 
unpack entitlement, the bane of Zimbabwean politics. And I think a useful prospect of breaking that culture down in Zimbabwe is really the search for shared values. And, you know, we will not succeed if anyone comes with political values, organizational values, moral values, and say these are shared values. If we are serious about finding shared values which unite us regardless of our affiliations, political affiliations, that is our cultural backgrounds, religious uh, faiths, our ethnicity, our uh, race, our language, and our generational differences. If we are serious about that, let us take serious what we did yesterday, which is in 2013, coming up with a new constitution that sought to address all the problems we had before that. There are many things wrong with that constitution, but one thing right is found in section three of the constitution on Zimbabwe's founding values and principles. There lies our constitutional values that can unite us as Zimbabweans. And I think it would be wonderful to do so if we could ahead of the 2023 general election. Thank you very much. My apologies for taking some 15.